So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our um, ITAG Cyber Summit 2021. Um, coming up uh, just shortly is uh, Derek Laffin, who will be talking to us about the future challenges and opportunities uh, in relation to uh, cyber psychology. Uh, and we'll be uh, starting that uh, shortly. So uh, just, uh, I'm Garrett Taylor, I'm a software architect uh, with uh, IBM Security uh, here in Galway, uh, well, virtually here in Galway today, of course, and uh, I'm just going to be your moderator for today's session with Derek. And um, so just to uh, introduce you to um, a couple of little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, if you can keep your camera off, and your mute on during the session and to get the best view if you choose the speaker view from the top right hand corner of your uh, zoom zoom session All right. Um, I think if uh, I think it looks like we've got a good uh, good quorum already, so I think we'll get the ball rolling on the session. Uh, so I think we one more slide to go uh, if we can do that, and then I'll uh, then we we'll get going with Derek. All right. So just uh, just to say very welcome to uh, Derek, who's our guest here at our Cybersecurity Summit this, this afternoon. Uh, Derek's a researcher in psychology with DCU, and today he's going to talk to us about the uh, his rethinking of cyber psychology and the future challenges and opportunities that that presents for us. So uh, rather than me uh, speak for Derek and who he is and uh, what he likes to do when he's uh, when he's not uh, deep in research, I'm going to hand you straight over to Derek. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Um, am I, I'm, I'm Evan, I, I can be heard okay and so on. Am I? Yeah, good to go. Glad to hear, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's, it's really, really nice to, 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 to meet all of you, um, whether virtually or not. So it's great to do it. It's, it's a new audience for me to, to work with for my own career. So I'm very excited to meet you. My name is Derek Laffin. And um, as Garrett like very nicely introduced me there, I do a lot of psych psychology research in Dublin City University. Um, more specifically, um, I'm a researcher in the National Anti-Bullying Research and Resource Centre. And um, most of my research and, and jobs here are to kind of bring cyber psychology and kind of digital technology ideas to tackling bullying and kind of promoting online safety. Um, now, and the audience tends to be a lot of young people, as you can imagine, in doing that. So there is some crossover between what I do and, and in terms of the, of the, of, of the, you know, the work around tackling kind of cybersecurity issues uh, that you go. And, but in generally, from a very a general sense, uh, my perspective is from an academic study of cyber psychology. Um, and um, I'm hoping today, I don't come to you as, as an expert in cyber security, um, but I, I do, I, and I, I'm not here to claim you as, as cyber psychology uh, disciplines either, um, but I'm hoping to kind of give a small bit of overview about where I think a field that intersects with what you guys do um, as practitioners of cyber security um, and, and so on, and what we do in the academic study of psychology in, and cyber psychology, and where I think that some questions about, particularly as, you know, I think to ignore the pandemic, if it hasn't already raised its head at this conference, I'd imagine, I'd imagine it will as it goes, um, will kind of will kind of shape it. And I think some of the questions that I have about how it goes are the same questions that you will have about your own practices. And it would be nice to kind of discuss that and see how they go. And that was kind of the, the bridge I thought I'd bring to the conference. So um, I'm going to start my slides um, as, as we go, and um, yeah, I'd, be, I'd love to take some questions or ideas you have uh, as we go and bring your expertise to me a little bit, because I'd, I'd like to learn that too. So I'm going to share my screen now with my, with my, with my fancy PowerPoint slides. And, and I have kind of aptly called this, it's, I can, this, is, this is coming across okay, Garrett, is it, if everyone's able to see this from your end of things. 
good stuff. Okay, so so yeah, um, I've I've kind of dubiously called this uh, rethinking cyber psychology to, to think that we need to rethink it at all. I suppose is one is is one question, and I've talked about future challenges and opportunities, and um, just given the. The, the state of how our society has been over the last two years, given the, the pandemic situation. So I kind of married a bit of that as it goes. And um, I'm going to just talk to you a very brief outline of what cyber psychology is. And um, because I'm going to make an argument that even though you all may not be doing cyber psychology, I think it'd be unfair to say that you are cyber psychologists, but I will definitely argue that there is some cyber psychology in your practice. Um, and I think that it'd be nice to kind of highlight that a bit more intricately and be able to see that different areas of, of how you work and how we work um, in the academic side of things and, and how they're actually more closer aligned than we might actually imagine. And I kind of want to then talk us through some of the sub-disciplines of cyber psychology, the topical areas. Um, and I kind of want to give like a small helicopter overview of how they've how they've kind of fared on, fed it on through the pandemic, different types of findings in different areas. Um, and I think some of the questions that need to be answered as a result of that as well. And then I'm going to talk then briefly about rethinking how we're going to actually tackle some of those questions and those problems that have emerged um, as a result of that. And that I thought would be, be a talk that we might be might have a good discussion on and hopefully raises some questions. Um, if, if anything, more, more newer, better questions and answers, what I hope it brings. So I'm going to get started on doing that as well. So I really hope you enjoy it and take something from this. Um, but I am looking forward to hearing from you too. So what is cyber psychology? And I think, I think from the opposite, looking at the world of it, you kind of might even imagine what it is. And some of you, as I'd imagine, know what it is. And some of you may not. So you can kind of see it from the uh, from the language that it's got probably something to do with the cyber world or digital or something. And then you've got psychology, which is human behavior and so on. And you'd actually be very right if you come to that kind of conclusion uh, as it goes. Um, and basically the way it's kind of looked, so I just want to move my screen over here a little bit because I can't see my own slide now. There we go, there we go, perfect. Um, so we kind of know that psychology is a study of human behavior and mental processes. Um, it is not the only study of human behavior and mental processes. There's lots of different people study those different things in their own disciplines, but psychology is definitely one way of looking at that and it's generally taken as, a, as an academic study for that. And cyber psychology is kind of an applied area of that. Um, and it's when it applies information technology uh, to human behavior and mental processes. Um, and like, for example, one of the, just off the cuff before I get into any more of it, like for one of the core questions that we might ask is, do we talk to each other differently through different digital media? So as I'm talking to you now, um, if I presented this face to face in the classroom, would I be different? Would I come across as different? Some might say yes, some might say no. The cyber psychologists are interested in what makes that difference unique as a, as a, as a philosophical question and so on. So to break that down a bit more, cyber psychology is a very relatively new but broad discipline. Um, and, it, and as you would imagine, it's got something to do with interacting with others using digital technology. For example, like how do we talk to some people differently online than offline? Um, and you might imagine that we do. Do we, you know, how do we tackle like, you know, how we, how we talk to others using WhatsApp to face to face or even using different media and so on. And the research will say that we do. Um, and in my field of like tackling cyberbullying, you know, you can only imagine how we talk to people differently through the medium of technology and so on. So it's very important that that question is asked. So it's about interacting with others using digital technologies that we use every day that are given to us. It's also about how we develop our systems and applications to suit needs and wants. And I think this is where a lot of your work is probably where the, the sides that you know most about your end of things. And I've given an example of making like an e-commerce site user friendly. And now I, you know, user friendly and UX and UI design is also a part of cyber psychology and so on to a degree. Um, but, but again, there's other ways of looking at this, but psychology is always going to be a kind of a core mechanism in that too. Um, and we look at needs-based approaches and wants-based approaches in our human behavior. Some of you are probably used to, you are more familiar with the idea of like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and so on, and other motivational aspects like our competence, our core, you know, being able to experience the world around us with freedom and exercise our, our competencies and our skills. So they're very important for how we navigate systems and devices. What kind of freedoms do we give users? And what kind of restrictions are in place for when they need to be there? So we're interested in those areas as well. And they can be psychological as well as they can be security um, or for other reasons too. So we're concerned with that too. 
And then we're also concerned about our psychological states and behavior that's affected by digital technology. So for example, my own academic background specifically looks into video gaming and mental health. So what does, it, what does it feel like when we have played a video game and we feel super accomplished after beating the end boss or the baddie and, you know, we feel like we've just, have we wasted six hours of our lives when all we've done is put blocks at the bottom of the screen to make sure they don't reach the top like in Tetris. So our psychological states are very much so um, affected by and affected of um, our digital technologies as they go. So this, I think is, is, is a great way of looking at the, the broadness of cyber psychology and doing it. And I would imagine that everybody that's in this con that's in this talk right now has something got to do with any of that in their practice. Um, but again, it doesn't claim that cybersecurity is cyber psychology, but again, the cyber psychology is in the field somewhere around that. And I'll get into that a bit more later on as well. Another way of looking at this um, is to visualize this differently about what I mean by psychological states and psychological phenomena and what we mean by digital technology, because they're also vague concepts. So I've kind of, this, I don't know, sorry, this is not like, I'm not a massive graphic designer myself, so I'm kind of just kind of get, getting it around it. But to have a look at what the more the psychological things we're interested in are things like our problem solving, thinking, our well being, our perception. The things that make us core human, the, what adds up to human experience is then married together with our IT. So our things like our graphic design, our online dating sites, our databases, hacking, malware, um, you know, I mean, artificial intelligence. When those things are married together, we can kind of do it. And the reason I wanted to show this diagram is because, again, cyber psychology is that intersection, but so could communication studies and so could digital anthropology. So could other areas that are there. And that's good for psychology because it actually kind of thrives on this idea that it's multidisciplinary and that it's also kind of similar to other disciplines in such a way that it can, you know, I mean, that it has a foundation and it has a way to go forward. So this is not necessarily an invented field, so to speak. It's an applied branch and um, that kind of goes with it constantly to evolve with, with the technologies around us. So I'm hoping that really kind of hammers home the what is cyber psychology and we get the idea and, and so to speak. And, and again, just to reiterate that I think that all of our, all your practices in cybersecurity and so on really fetter into, into this scope somewhere along the lines. Um, and afterwards, I would love to hear though how exactly that that might actually work with you. Um, because again, not coming from a cyber security background, um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to go that side of things. So that's essentially cyber psychology. And I hope that's kind of, um, very well explained to you in terms of visual and so on. Um, and like most areas, I think like cybersecurity, I think, you know, I'm gonna make an argument that I think that the pandemic years, not that they're over, I'm not suggesting that they are, but has really spotlighted some of the, the core issues that need to be worked on or, or may, have, may have made invented new ones um, to worry about. Um, and I think it's a very exciting area to be in at the moment, given what's, what's happening. And no more is it more important, like we see the HSC cyber attack the health service executive at the health system in Ireland, it was ferociously attacked by a ransomware attack, wasn't it? Um, I mean, I mean, how relevant is, is our, our cybersecurity and our human behavior and what we think and know about our systems when these things happen? And they happen at the height of a pandemic whereby extensive you know, behavior online has, has very much so evolved and, and, and kind of um, expanded on because we need to be online more because schools were closed and our workplaces, our bedrooms became our workplaces. Um, if they weren't already. So, um, you know, it's very, very exciting and dynamic time. And I think something like this really fits into those models or has a part to play. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the challenges and opportunities as an academic discipline for cyber psychology. And I'm going to kind of include cybersecurity a little bit in this, but there is an overall overview on this. And I hope that it brings a different dimension uh, to what you're still in practice. See you. So basically the argument is that emerging research, and this is the empirical evidence is what we're going by here a little bit, that across many topic areas within cyber psychology are noting how COVID-19 has made an impact. Um, and this is where every field, whether it's in video gaming, social networking sites, online dating, music, film, uh, security, online safety, you name it, have all experienced something very different in their areas because of the pandemic and what it has actually brought to it. Uh, one of those, I think is the most obvious, um, is, is about online fraud, and it's risen exponentially during the pandemic. And I'm saying this very openly, but every day I'm getting my phone is ringing three times a day with numbers that I even recognize, and I answer it, and I'm going, hello, and it's then trying to get money out of me. I don't know what it's doing, but I just hang up, you know? So I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's, 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 it's very obvious that this is the case that it, that it has done. 
and the research has shown obviously that um that this is that this very much so is supported there was some figures i think by um rte which is the irish media service um the national media and they talk i think it's like 400 percent of of different cases have been done now you're the experts in this and know more about than i will but the research is actually kind of kind of agreeing with that so online scam attempts have increased significantly but other crimes have decreased like obviously you'd stand to reason that burglaries have decreased do you know what i mean because of obviously everyone's at home but scams have actually increased naturally because we're online more so what is it from a psychological perspective I can add to this, if you haven't talked about this already, like Chang and Chong, this is Chinese research that looked into a bit more about, about the UR called cognitive heuristics. So scammers are capitalizing on specific ones that trip people with COVID-19. And what I mean by that is that if we think about the problems and our urgences and our human needs during COVID-19, things like we're, or our sense of urgency, our fear and our worry, um, were things that were really heightened during this pandemic and we might make irrational decisions and we saw with the panic buying and we saw with how people click on sites and and and, and, and you know i mean the susceptibilities of clicking on maybe malware because of that so they're cognitive heuristics it basically means mental shortcuts uh, and doing so so they very much so are capitalizing on that side of things to make us fall for scams um, and, and doing so. So it's not a case that the technology, I'm going to make an argument that has become more sophisticated. It's because they've more been sophisticated of the human element. And as, as, as one of my colleagues, Nicola Fox Hamilton has perpetuated, they're using our own psychology against us. Um, and that is what makes a great scammer um, from that point of view. However, other research approaches have actually kind of argued that, you know, fraud and other economic crime has always been associated with pandemics. It's not necessarily attributed to the digital technology. Um, and they make a great case that during the Spanish flu and other pandemics that happened right since then and there, there's always been a rise in 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 how in a, in how cr economic crime and people capitalizing on those cognitive heuristics has been put in place. So I mean, from that point of view, is that like we can learn from you know the digital side of things with COVID, but fundamentally, has there been uh, much difference in terms of how scammers capitalize on that? And those are questions that are worth talking about, and that if if they haven't been addressed already. Um, another area, um, particularly relates to mine, is that more young people have reported. Um, cyberbullying, online hate, and misinformation. Um, and this is research that I've been I've been doing with my colleagues in the Anti-Bullying Centre in Milosevic et al. We found um, that young people across Ireland and Europe definitely reported more cyberbullying incidences. The questions we have is that is it because more people are online they're going to report it, or has there been generally more cyberbullies actually carrying out? And you kind of imagine the questions about frequency and volume around it. But nonetheless, there is more cyberbullying. Uh, other research has, has, has argued that what this actually means in terms of aftercare. So if more people are going to be experiencing bullying and cyberbullying, it's going to put a more strain and more demand for services and resources. We have to look after the people that are experiencing this. Um, and what's that going to mean for the services um, that are provided? So there's going to have to be some economic investment um, if it hasn't been already uh, for those. And we saw in the budget recently in Ireland that there has been some extra um, uh, allocations for mental health services, probably not enough, um, but we're kind of becoming aware of that problem as we go. And what that's going to mean is that there's going to be more prolonged mental health disruption if they can't access those services because of it. So even though the pandemic will end, I would be optimistic that it will come to a point that we're kind of over our COVID years, there is going to be that knock-on effect of people that are going to have that um, uh, from, from that as we go. So again, these challenges, I think, present as opportunities um, as well to be able to tackle them. Other research talks about like, the fact that like you know school closures mean more people are averting to online schooling like it was very obvious that traditional bullying uh, those rates decreased because people weren't in school they were at home and um, so that you know there's, there's sometimes there's logical explanations for these but it doesn't defer the fact that there's more of it um, and online schooling basically means that and i'm going to talk to that about that point next um, about how online schooling happened during the pandemic but it does talk to us that more and heavier internet use has become the norm. It's not becoming the norm, it has become the norm. And what does that tell us about uh, rates and uses? Um, for those of you that did online schooling with children as well, I kind of want to give you a bit of a big up to you because it has generally been seen as a massive disruptor in, in Irish households. Um, uh, online schooling is a term we're using for it because um, it's, been, it's been coined as differently to homeschooling um, because we've had frameworks for homeschooling for years. 
And this idea of emergency online schooling um, has been very different. And this is a conversation that never happened before, is when it becomes emergency use. And this is online schooling now is a new phenomenon that has cropped up in terms of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of, of living in the pandemic and so on. So there has been research in the Irish context on this, but also globally as well. Um, schooling online from home was seen as a major stressor in Irish households. Um, it was unwanted. It was something that was typically not enjoyed. That's the usual experience. It's obviously some people would like it or not. Um, I'm in a family of myself and my sister. We're both adults and my parents. Um, and I still live at home. But the, the reality is that, you know, if like, everyone's working, how would we have had time if we had a, a young kid in the house, whether it was mine or somebody else's? You know, and so it's been very difficult to adjust to that on top of our workload. So you can imagine how stressful and how and the toll that has had on both the learner and the parent who has to administer that. And then what kind of help do they receive from the schools? Which brings us on to my research, which we did in the Anti-Bullying Centre about finding that out. So we were able to be part of a joint network of um, researchers across Europe um, called the JRC, which is a Joint Research Commission of the European Commission. And we looked at things like children's internet use, um, children's attitudes towards using technology, their parents. Did they get more cyberbullying? Did they get more online hate? Or what were the advantages as well, like mediation opportunities, uh, digital skills? Was there improvement? Was there not? And one of the most striking uh, issues that we found was that children in Ireland purported to be the most worried children in Europe about their online schooling. And when we dug deeper into that, that type of finding, which was quite surprising to us, there was actually a whole host of reasons for it, uh, such as that the ill preparedness of schools to actually have that level of, of capability to go online in emergency situations. Uh, at the time of the pandemic, children had questions about, like, particularly in exam years, like, what's that going to mean for me? I'm studying my leave inserts. It's a, it's a major examination we have in Ireland that's going to determine that you get a job afterwards or go into further or higher education. And what does that mean for us if the teacher that I had face to face can't? properly work a computer or can't, you know, doesn't get to grips with Zoom as we, as we need to use our Microsoft Teams or whatever they were using. So that worry kind of showed us that that confidence in our leaders' abilities to be able to do that wasn't there. Um, and what that knock-on effect was for their learning uh, was really problematic. And we found that they were excessively worried about grades um, and their engagement in school and access to teachers, particularly during exam years. Parents and children reported increased worry about online safety as well, uh, which cropped up a lot because people don't have or didn't say that they had as adequate training with new technologies that were coming out in the actual um, during the pandemic. Zoom was something I'm talking about Zoom fatigue a bit later on in this, but Zoom is a new technology that I, I, I never heard of. Maybe maybe you did. I never heard of it until 2000. And, you know, the ECU had to buy its licenses to use it because everyone was using it. Prior to that, I was using Skype. And I don't need to have to tell me what happened there, why, why we don't maybe don't use Skype anymore with it. But you know, people were worried about these technologies that were coming out for that, and they, they didn't know about them, but we had to use them very quickly for our work and our schooling. And then getting good grades and compute and completing school activities. In our research as well, we found that teachers uh, across Ireland were not actually giving um, students a, con a consistent amount of work over on a weekly basis and on a daily basis. And that again also eroded trust between. Uh, learners and that during school. Some students actually reported receiving no instruction from the school during lockdown when schooling went online. And then other students actually said, we got too many, we got too much, um, and what that meant. So we don't have something in place for that um, if that ever happens again. That's the doom and gloom um, of, of, <laughs> of things so far. And I promise you there's optimistic side of it. And this is where, this is where I think it is. So I'm gonna show you some things that research in areas that actually was kind of optimistic. Um, about it as well that might be has its challenges but also has its opportunities too so for example the area that i know quite well is video gaming and mental health and the world health organization actually came out and said well actually we recommend play, um, children continue to play their video games as an effective way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and they had this hashtag play apart together uh, campaign um, online about it but it was actually quite controversial for them to do that because prior to that in 2017, 2018, they actually purport that they're going to endorse what's called criteria for gaming disorder. So they had this idea that they were going to put in that, you know, you could have a mental illness from playing games because they were so um, engaging and they were so like addictive or whatever working it. So for them to come out now and say that we recommend you play more of it, 
than they did. It was actually very controversial or, um, as, a, as a stance they took, but nonetheless, they did recommend that as an effective way to prevent it. And they were actually right from an empirical point of view. Research showed that video gamers did report increased well-being playing games during the lockdowns. Um, and other researchers were actually able to look at the, the amount of gaming that was happening, and they were able to show that the amount of it wasn't actually indicative of addiction or problematic play. But those with prior problems, like having state anxiety um, or prior or prior other uh, issues that might actually, you know, I mean, be predictive of like conduct problems or something else, and um, they were likely more at risk. And again, reinforces the idea that video game play is not necessarily problematic from a video game's point of view, but it is, it can be an extension of, of behavior that's problematic. Um, in terms of music, um, again, this is an area that, again, that ties in with cyber psychology because music technology um, and how we do that as well is, is very much so part of the discipline. Um, and I'm sure some of you might have saw on on Twitter and on other things as well, that you might have seen people singing from balconies um, or people really engaging with their, with their ideas. And there were lovely, lovely um, videos of, of sheer solidarity and, 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 and lovely moments of care really between people that never talked to each other. And this was something that was never, well, it obviously probably could have been seen during the pandemic, but it was really highlighted during the pandemic. People singing and dancing from balconies and gardens. Um, research into this um, is that, you know, music listening and singing became a coping strategy during lockdown. I'm sure some of you might have listened to music a lot more during the lockdown. And actually, it, it, that was actually helpful for our, our, our moods and our attitudes towards the pandemic. And then other research, uh, again, showed that people more engaged with different things with music. For example, the idea of attending virtual concerts was very rarely heard of um, prior, to, prior to the pandemic. And then it became a norm. Um, around us. So we saw virtual concerts or we saw things like, you know, if you watch the Late Late Show or chat shows that they had no audience and people were still engaged with the, with the content as it went very, very quickly and that adaptability was there. So people were engaged with that as, as they would go. Um, and obviously social networking. And I say this, I'm putting this as an advantage uh, rather than disadvantage because we, we could talk about that in both ways. But um, it was absolutely crucial um, to be able to disseminate health information during the pandemic. So, for example, um, uh, research had suggested social media was a positive coping strategy, particularly to lonely adolescents in lockdown. Um, and of course, where would we be without social network to some degree ourselves? Um, social media was crucial to disseminate, I think I've said that, uh, health information during the pandemic. And then obviously there was greater collaboration with and communication between uh, bodies like, for example, NEFIS and the government and are and, and used online. They really relied on it as a way to get that across. On the flip side to that, there has been an increase of misinformation, disinformation, and, and you know, resulting from that. But it's important that we look at the actual pros from that. So I just wanted to put that there um, as an idea for that too. Um, and that, that, that kind of just was some of the initial thoughts that I had about the overview of cyber psychology and these things that we never thought about before um, and what that might mean for the future as we go on with questions that we have. So um, two fundamental questions that I believe that we need to answer about all of these changes or things that we found out that we never knew before, um, particularly with our behavior online and our digital technology and so forth, is how do we know if COVID or has COVID-19 actually changed our behavior online? Um, are we actually doing things much differently than we did prior to the, to the pandemic? And it's a big question because it's very difficult to, to measure change. Um, change might be a small word, but it's a, it's a big word in the social sciences. Um, change can mean influence. It can mean um, it can mean literal change. It can also mean decreases, increases, um, and so on. Um, so it's very hard to do that. And to be able to attribute the pandemic uh, around our behaviors and that is actually quite a hard question to ask because it's hard to quantify these. Or has COVID-19 spotlighted the deficits of contributions that technology brings to the human experience? And that's a great question, I think, for you guys, for cybersecurity experts, about talking about things like the, the amount of online scams that have happened. Is it the case that online scams are, have been, you know, increased because it's the pandemic? Or as research had showed earlier on, has it always been increased because pandemics has always been an opportunity for scammers and, and criminals to be able to take advantage of our so-called mental heuristics? and so on. 
And they're very crucial questions because we are now going to have to live with the ways that we change our behavior during the pandemic to now. Like, for example, the, the state are now going to tell us that working from home is probably going to be more of an option for a lot of people. There's going to be some legal framework, I think, coming into play about that. Um, and that's going to change how we've worked on a daily basis. Is that because of COVID? I think it is. But other questions arise. Can we draw conclusions about the impact of the, of the pandemic if we don't have pre-pandemic data to compare to? Sorry, I'm getting a bit crosswired here now. One of the issues with pandemic research is that because researchers were in such a rush to understand the effects of the pandemic and get the papers published as well, it's very hard to draw conclusions if you don't have pre-data or pre-evidence to kind of match it to, you know? So that kind of, that kind of conversation needs to be had from a methodological point of view as well as from a, from a practical point of view of that. And if we can't draw that conclusion empirically, then that, that makes that question harder to answer, is how much it changes, to get a snapshot of how we're working. If it won't be business as usual uh, post pre-pandemic, that's what our, our politicians have said, it won't be business as usual, there'll be changes made and so on. If we're not gonna go back to how things were, how do we know at a societal level how the pandemic has changed things. Because it seems like now the pandemic has changed and kept us going rather than going back to the way we were, so to speak. And that actually raises questions on a fundamental level as well that we have to get used to it. And especially if an oncoming pandemic happens, how that's going to change. So that adaptability level makes it also harder on a philosophical point of view to determine change. And how do we determine what that is? We have to have a good idea of measurement and conception of change and doing it. Um, as well, I think that stands that stands to reason from it. So these are the kind of philosophical questions when I was looking at the, the discipline and those changes that came to mind when I was speaking. It. And I think if we're able to answer those questions, I think we're doing we're doing very good uh, for the future is how we go. And I think I think these are questions that again you all have in your own practices um, or studies um, in cybersecurity and beyond. So I hope I'm not over thinking just assuming cybersecurity, but I'm just kind of assuming that that's the focus of, of where I'm going. Um, yeah, so this is kind of where it's, it's not just in terms of what happens that, that makes our behavior fascinating online and so forth as well. There's, there's been new things that happen that never, that never, that we knew about video games and social networking, but what about the newer kind of phenomena and new things that happened that we never talked about before and, 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 that, and, that, and that kind of crept up to, to be worthy of study? Uh, new phenomena, illnesses, and psychological concerns are to think about in the future as well that we need to go. And one of them I kind of want to heed to a little bit about is this idea of Zoom fatigue. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you've all heard of Zoom fatigue to some degree, uh, but it was something that we never talked about or never heard of until, what, 2020. Uh, and now all of a sudden there's no diagnostic criteria for Zoom fatigue. There's no measurement for Zoom fatigue. I'm wondering, can you ring your boss now and say, I need a day off tomorrow because I was on this Zoom meeting and I've got fatigue now. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that to minimize or destroy it, but these are questions that have to be asked uh, from all sorts of ways if we're going to pathologize um, our energy and our exhaustion as a result of using Zoom. Um, so much media coverage has been given to Zoom fatigue. Um, for example, some has said it's going to be, uh, this is actually the... Oh my God, the National Geographic said Zoom fatigue is going to be with us for years. Here's how we'll cope. And then, of course, you have other ones as well. Like, for example, this is the, I think this is the BBC that said Zoom fatigue won't last forever. So um, it's, you know, there's not enough information to go on and whether I'm doing it. And I'll be honest, it has been met with some skepticism. And I'll also purport that I'm one of the skeptics as well, a little bit from a theoretical level, but it doesn't excuse that we had no exhaustion and so forth. And there is empirical evidence to kind of give, uh, give way about, about Zoom fatigue and so on. Um, and they've given some rationale about what Zoom fatigue is. Um, and we've come at it from a fatigue point of view. Um, it's looking at exhaustion as a result of using Zoom. But they said that there's actually different ways of actually looking at Zoom fatigue as a result of Zoom. So they said that it's not just a case of being exhausted after having meetings and meetings and meetings. It's because you're what's called mirroring is happening um, when we use Zoom. Now, I don't have that right now because I've minimized my screen so I can just focus on my content and talk in, into the microphone to use. But when we're in our Zoom meetings, we can normally see ourselves um, as, our, as our go and we can kind of see everyone else. And apparently, according to them, a part of the theoretical side of it is that we're also monitoring and being conscious of that as well as trying to contribute to the meetings and contribute to, to how we're going. And that's, that's, that's part of our exhaustion. On top of that as well, the setup uh, and the, the maintenance of Zoom uh, has also given rise to some of the, the symptoms idea and so on. 
In this research as well by uh, Fauville et al., this is um, the Zoom exhaustion and fatigue scale, which is um, available in computers and human behavior reports. And they, they've broken Zoom fatigue down to these general areas. You've got general fatigue, visual fatigue, social fatigue, motivational and emotional fatigue. For example, how tired you feel after video conferencing, whereas how much do you tend to avoid social situations after conferencing and so on. And the argument that some of the skeptics have made is that like we didn't talk about Skype fatigue, um, or we didn't look at it from the point of view that people that who suffer with fatigue generally, for example, with ME or CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome that might you know, live with fatigue in such a way that it disrupts their life and so on. But now we're going we're gonna to have a comparative to that called Zoom fatigue. So it's been met with its, its skeptics. And I think, I think there's going to be more questions about that as it goes and so on. But nonetheless, um, meetings are exhausting. And so can Zoom be as, as problematic as it is. But I thought it was worth mentioning that it was something new um, that came up during the pandemic and it's, it's pathologized, uh, so to speak. Um, another one um, that came out as well as the idea of called fear of COVID-19. And I think very rightly so. I think you know, the, the idea of fear of COVID is like, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a virus, isn't it? It's something that's real and it's something that can, that can harm us and kill us and so on. So, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very normal to have an idea that, um, that we have a fear of COVID. And there's been cases, like for example, the, the media article on the right, this man was found wandering around Chicago airport and wouldn't leave because apparently he was, had so much fear of COVID uh, and with the media around it. And, and it is a very worrying time. It's a very anxiety ridden time for people. So not to diminish um, fear of COVID, but the, the, again, some skepticism about this rose during the pandemic from an academic point of view uh, about some of its scales and measurements. So this is the main scale for measuring fear of COVID. Um, and like, for example, I'd ask general people, like things like, I'm most afraid of coronavirus. It makes me uncomfortable to think about it. My hands become clammy as they probably would do during anxiety and, and stressful situations, afraid of losing my life and so on. So the argument is, is that it came out, its, it's date was actually very problematic. So the publication of the scale for fear of COVID, which has now been widely cited, was in 27th of March in 2020. Although we hadn't really started talking about much COVID-19 since January. So within three months, this paper has been conceptualized the idea from a pathological point of view and measured it. Uh, so again, this has been met with some academic scrutiny and skepticism online. But again, just to kind of, it's something for, the, for people to, to talk about in terms of the future and measurement. And then it sparked a conversation about how we measure psychological constructs. So there's actually been now an abundance of academic papers kind of making up psychological concepts like offline friend addiction. And they've been putting it into journals saying, we can just make up a psychology variable now and we can put a scale and we can say that people suffer with it because of um, articles like this that have now been, been problematized um, because of it. However, there is genuine fear of COVID-19. Um, it's, it's very rational to have that fear. It's a worrying time and a fearful thing to get. Um, and there is fear of getting diseases and, and fear of needles that are attributed. So even in concept, you could argue very loosely that it is, but I'm not here to, 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 to diminish it. I'm here just to acknowledge it and, and see the, some of the shortcomings from an academic sphere. So it's just interesting to bring that to your attention. On that. Uh, Derek, just to yeah. remind you there, we're just coming up to the 22 the hour. So I know we Fantastic. said- Fantastic. And I'm, just, I'm actually just about finished. I'm brilliant. Oh, thanks, perfect. Thanks, Gary. Thanks a million. So I'm not too far off. So how will we answer these questions? Um, and I think this is where, again, this is where our interests line up. Yeah, so you guys are doing this and in academia, we're doing this as well in cyber psychology. Um, is that how to answer these kind of questions that the pandemic has brought us for cyber psychology, we're going to be relying on our evidence-based process and solutions. What is the evidence saying? Cyber psychology is an evidence-based discipline. Uh, conclusions are drawn for about human behavior by analyzing data and previous work. Um, and as we know, data is probably the new gold. Um, so, and the more valuable it is, the harder it is to acquire. And that gives us questions about big data, which is one of the which is kind of the big things lately. But big data is not necessarily better, better data. Um, and what you could do with, when you, where you, where you make up in better data, you lose, sorry, in big data, you lose for depth. Um, so it's important that we consider the value and contribution of our data. And then there's a recent push for what's called open data uh, of methods and, and, and sharing of, of how we acquire that as well. So that we have that transparency um, of how our methods and our data is going. And that's sparked conversations about privacy and ethics again, to bring data uh, away from not just data protection, there's always going to be data protection, but it's also an ethical argument and it brings it back to that. But that's again becoming more common in academia now is open data. And data-driven solutions are evidence-based solutions. 
Um, collaboration, I saw that there was going to be a talk on this later on, I think after me, about diversity um, in the area, and this is exactly um, where, where this is going to. Collaborative, diverse and multidisciplinary approaches are what's also key and essential in cyber psychology. And I don't just mean that in terms of, um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that means like things like graphic designers meet with media scholars, and they meet with teachers, and they meet with software developers. It's a real mixed bag of who's involved in this science. And collaboration, it wouldn't be a field without collaboration and diversity. And diversity is seen as its core strength. People, gender, ethnicity, disciplines, communication studies, psychology, ideas, which theory is right, which theory is wrong, and approaches of how we should solve those problems. And again, it's theory and policy driven. So cyber psychology is an applied psychology and it benefits from drawing from psychological areas like Freud, like, like your, you know, your social identity theory, your all these things that are bringing place. And then it informs policies that actually guide our legal and our behavioral and financial frameworks in place as they go. And that's, these are things that are in practice in your own disciplines, I would imagine. Um, and I know just for time that I just kind of, if, you, if I have a takeaway thing for you to look at, and um, this is a report that we did in, in the National Antibodies Centre called Kitty Coty, Kids Digital Lives in COVID-19 Times. And these are some of the changes that children and their parents have reported about their online world or the digital ecosystem, the digital practices, if you will, of, of how they've gone uh, during the pandemic. So I'd love you to take a look at that. And it's free to download uh, from our site. So I don't, I haven't got the link. I can put the link in later or something or by email, but it's, it's just there. You can get it easily accessible if you just type in the name and go to the Anti-Bullying website, the Anti-Bullying Centre's website in Dublin City University. And we have courses um, in cyber psychology. If this is of interest to you, it's going forward. A bit of a plug for these as well, I'm going to have to. But there is a certificate um, that you can do on a part-time basis. Um, if you're looking at it, getting just a very general, um, quick and quick overview of doing that in, in the Dunleary Institute of Art, Design and Technology. And they've also got a master's program if you wish to have more of a specialism from, a, from an academic um, perspective um, as it goes. Um, and that's it for me in terms of the, my talk. And um, I want to thank you. And I hope, I hope this has been somewhat interesting to you or beneficial in some way. And um, I will try to answer questions that you have, about, just not from a cybersecurity uh, expert point of view, but I would definitely love to hear from you about, about some of this and relating to your own practice. Um, and that could be something good as well. You can reach me on Twitter. I am a Twitter fanatic. I love, I like, I, like, I think Twitter is great for, for this as well. So do follow me and I'll follow you. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn, although I, I rarely use that. And I probably should more than anything else. And um, that's it from me. So um, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Derek. Fantastic. And I think uh, definitely uh, something to get us out of the weeds of the, the nuts and bolts of computers there for uh, 45 minutes and get us thinking, thinking uh, on a different angle. Um, yeah. I think you definitely uh, spark quite a few uh, questions and comments there in the chat. So uh, as well as uh, plenty of folks who are saying they're really, really interesting talks. So thank you, yeah. once again, thank you very much. So there are a couple of, we've got about 10 minutes or so before we'll be uh, vacated from this session here. So a few, a uh, couple of questions. So um, one, I think, which, which kind of leads into the, the cyber, the cyber world really was uh, a question are, did it, is there in, anything coming out to show that maybe people are becoming better aware of things like their privacy, uh, their exposure to social engineering and what that is? And then also, is there something emerging, you know, in the culture, uh, and I guess in the, you know, the, the cyber psychology really of, of people uh, as they're addressing that? So I think that's kind of a, a nice, good question from Cormac there, which brings both of those fields together. So Yeah, I, I think if, I, if I'm going back to some of the work that I've done on this, I, I, I linked us to the Kitty Cody Kids Digital Lives report. And mm. in that, they talk about some of the core competencies that have improved during the, during the pandemic. So confidence for these have very much so been um, have 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 been expand, have been expanded on greatly by them, and they're reporting like to talk about what a digital skill is. That's, that's such a vague term now, isn't it? So the application of those skills have very much so seen as increased as they go. But we're now looking at a generation um, of of internet users that are so tech savvy. It's no longer a case of being like we're going to be in technology in the future. Like this is it. We're here now, and and this is this is where that's that's kind of coming along. Uh, and I think we're way past discussions on whether technology is good or bad. I think we're way past that point. And we're at a point where it's kind of like, how are we able to adapt to situations like COVID and with online schooling? Like you would think that we have something as basic as schooling that could just go on Zoom for very basic things down, but it was an utter flop. 
in terms of in terms of what schools and kids were reporting. And yes, they're the most tech savvy individuals. Um, in the anti-bullying center, we would interview kids all the time about their attitudes towards privacy because it changes what they do and say online, doesn't it? Yeah. They they know they, they know how to use the all the functions and they know they know more about it than we do. You know what I mean? And, and how it goes. I don't know what I don't use TikTok. Don't, you know, but they they know it. Um, and so they're the most tech savvy individuals, and that's why we talk about evidence based practice. And I know we work with kids, but they're the ones to ask. They're the ones that it's about for us. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's. We are seeing that yeah. their skills are more, the awareness of their skills and execution of them are in practice, but we're not giving them the environment to do that because we don't have it. Okay, so very interesting. So, so the, you know, the adults um, are the ones who haven't developed that awareness or, or maybe aren't changing their, their culture. And as a consequence, you know, kids are, are kind of being retarded in their ability to, to respond. Kind of, yeah, you kind of have to, you kind yeah. of have to see it from it, like from, from like, like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in St. Saint Pat's College. It's, it's literally like a teaching fortress, like, you know what I mean? So like, and a lot of teachers here with I mean, they do not, they don't have that immediate training to be able to just take all, we do imagine that the workload for a teacher has to now get all the lesson plans, get everything up onto, onto that, that can be carried across on Zoom, be able to competently give the lesson on Zoom. And they're not able for that because it happened like that without training. Like the training wasn't there because they didn't know we have to give training for a pandemic, you know? And this, this, this had a knock-on effect for kids being able to do that. And so the kids were ready for it, but we weren't because we didn't have that process. And that's a good opportunity for, for us to build better programs for that. And it just yeah. highlights some core issues and flaws in the system. Yeah, that came, was coming out a little bit in the chat as well, not... Uh, not pointing a finger at, a, at a, yeah. an education system because it was never, you know, never intended that. Yeah, but, exactly. Hey, is that system now, you know, and it is going to react and say, okay, now that we know that we have this situation, are we going to better scale our, you know, our kids and ourselves to, to deal with this? Uh, it's, you know, pride may come back again uh, or it may become the new part of the new norm for, for if, 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 if schools can close for any reasons you know it's not just for yeah. pandemics and and now that they've got and so one of our some of our research is trying to put policies in place to say if this happens again for for school closing and like now you might see kids that are off school that can now still do their homework and now still do their do their do their lesson online or you can link into the classroom just because you're sick in bed you know so um it's that kind of um that kind of behavior might start happening a bit more now because that was what it was able to do yeah. And um, do you, you know, in, in what you guys see, do you, is there a different level of trust uh, or do people have a, you know, do a different posture when they're interacting online than they do person to person? Are they more trusting? Where are they more trusting and they become less so? Have, have we become more, have we changed how we're behaving over line, even just by seeing scams and things like that going on? Oh, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good question on that. But I mean, we have to. I mean, particularly with I mean, I know I know my focus is, is with young people, and I'm, I'm just only saying what, what I know on that one is that they they've no choice but to trust their teachers. They've no choice but to trust their parents because they have to. And I don't mean that as in some authoritarian kind of sense or way, but like if you know we have to rely on our on our on our so called leaders uh, for doing that. Um, so you know I I don't know how to answer that question otherwise because um. In, in terms of trust, that's, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I'm stumped with it because I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah, entirely, no, no, no. but I, yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, good one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Coming at it from slightly different angles that yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're interacting with people, you know, when the person is in front of you or, you know, you're out and about in the real world, um, you'd have certain, you know, you'd establish trust through, cert trust through certain maybe norms or social, you know, psychological interactions mm. and so on. In the online world, it's different and... Right. Do we have different ways that we establish those types of? Um, I mean, choosing trust because of digital trust and yeah. you know, your your, you know, the the potential to be scammed and things but like part that. Of, but part of that, and, and, and sorry, yeah. now that you've said that, part of that trust is 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 the person's competence in using the technologies, because uh -huh. when we trust them to be able to use them. If they, we know that they're they're good at using them and confident in using them, it comes across as trusting because you you know your confidence is there. So you've lack of trust in someone's using this new technology. We're all in this online world or or, or area that that we're all in and didn't know. But teacher hasn't a clue on what button to press or do. It's not their fault because they didn't have that need that training prior to that. So it's not it's not coming from that it's disabled or it's not from a or is not able to work with that. It's because. And, 
I hate using the term because I'd be so used to it, but the unprecedentedness of the, <laughs> of the thing, you know what I mean, came, came into play in it. So it, it comes across when we don't know. And in our research, we found that when they didn't, they didn't know how to work Zoom or didn't give them lessons or capitalize on the functions of our, of our technologies, the kids did not, they, they worried more about their, about their, their grades and did so. And, and it really came across as, as effective on their anxiety. Very interesting. Uh, I just I didn't see what else we few there. So yeah, a few a lot of interest in the you know the reaction of kids and that too. Uh, some people saying that um, people are not really developing a stronger awareness of uh, you know cyber threats and are, are probably right. just as just I'm going to have to use the word naive, but just as yeah. you know likely to. Uh, fall foul of a scam than, than they ever were. Um, I'm not sure if that's something- It is, actually, I actually can a little bit because yeah. scams are, are, are so intricate. Like, I mean, like I said, they're using their own psychology against us as well. And this has not been quoted by me. I'm taking a quote from, from a colleague of mine, Nicola Fox Hamilton. But you have to remember that it's, 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 it's it, they, you know I mean? It's if like some scams you don't fall for, and that's because they're not aimed at you. Like there's academic scams here, like fake conferences, there's fake, you know, fake journals and fake fees, you know, and they're very easy to buy into because someone like me who I'd consider myself as an early career researcher needs to be kind of seen doing things like this, but also doing things like, you know, publishing and getting my work, uh, you know, I mean, reflected on and analyzed and whatever. And I could easily fall for a predatory journal or a predatory scam because the email looks great because it's aimed at me, but I probably won't fall for like, you know what I mean? A cryptocurrency one because I, I don't I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sorry, I know that sounds so ignorant. <laughs> yeah, I, bar yeah. I barely know what yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I, know, I know it's like an online currency. I'm just saying I just I've no interest in investing in it. You know what I mean? Like, and, so interesting. So it's it's possible that like you can raise you you can raise you raise people's awareness. They know these things are out there. They know they can't trust them, but. But they know they're actually being attacked on a by a different, mm. you know, I can use the word vector here, but they're coming at you from a different angle. And even though you have all of this awareness, you've yeah. got all the training. And that's why we laugh. And that's why we laugh when yeah. we see those email scams coming in and going, oh my God, look at this. They're going to leave their fortunes and be like, but they're not aimed at you because they just got to you. They're aimed and they have, they actually have like a 1% response rate. And you used to remember like if they, if they send that email out to hundreds and thousands of people and you get 1%, that's a huge number. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge number. And, and a person who's not familiar with like an older adult who's, you know, I mean, who's just kind of go, just going to click on it out of fear of clicking a button. You, you often give your phone to an older adult sometimes. They're like, oh, what's this? I'm afraid. And they're just natural. It's natural because it's a world away from what they know. We have yeah. to understand them, not the other way around. And that scan is designed for them. Uh, very yes yeah. so there, there's always me. one that's going to catch you yeah. um you know just despite the awareness because it's, it's catching you where you're i guess putting you off guard really or or it's taking your focus away from the oh i know i mustn't click this or yeah. whatever it is uh, yeah yeah Either i'm just rationalizing because i have fell for scams so i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so oh, yeah, very good yeah 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 excellent um so I get that sort of maybe the sense there is that uh, although we become more and more aware, we're probably just as likely to fall for these things because they've been crafted. They've been crafted for us using, you know, a completely different uh, or just needs psychologically. Are, exactly. They're, 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 they're targeting your specific personality and, and needs and urgencies and your core desires that you, you, you if you will fall for the scam because that's the way that maybe not on a personal level on it, but you will see it. It's just so getting conned is, is, is part of the human experience. And <laughs> for some reason, we, we, we do have the stigma of kind of saying, I, I wouldn't be conned. Not me, that's them. But like, you know, credit card skimming, you know what I mean? It can happen. You can be in Temple Bar and you're on a night out and like four o'clock in the morning, it, that's when it gets you because that's what it was designed for, you know? And that's where we need to go with it. Yeah, very good. Um, I think I think we're kind of covered there. Most of the most of the themes uh, in general is say a few people saying, you know, scams have always been out there. Oh. Uh, not seeing greater levels of awareness, but I think we kind of we chatted a little bit about that as well. Um, yeah, and so you say yes, say quote the day there at the <laughs> end. So I presume I'm, I'm, I'm just having to skip it as well. I see some people talking about their own practice and, and using some cyber psychology in that area as well. And it's great that that's the case, but even if you indirectly or don't do it explicitly, you're doing it implicitly. 
Um, and if and having been able to expand that a little bit more could, could show the advantages of these areas. But like I said, I, I can't offer much on the social security side of things, but on the human elements of it as well, sometimes these core ideas are so basic and simple that that's where they're from. And that's all it takes to understand it. So I'd say bring that out a lot more, you know. Of course, I'd say that, though. That's what I have to <laughs> yeah. but, that, but it is true, you know. So. Brilliant. Well, listen, Derek, uh, thank you so much for uh, your time to this afternoon. I think that's certainly uh, a very interesting session and certainly very Yeah, I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you. Yeah. As well. So, yeah, yeah, great in insight into uh, into the into that angle on the, um, well, the cyber psychology in general, but also uh, the... Um, uh, cyber security on that as well so just to say um next session up so starting at uh one o'clock that's one o'clock uh, irish time is our panel discussion so discussion of diversity and cyber security um certainly a really interesting topic and certainly i think uh probably still a challenge for the cyber security se sector is our uh diversity or perhaps perhaps lack of it so uh, really interesting part there, and I think also diversity strength comes through true diversity. So getting more diversity into the the sector is really really important for us. So that's coming up. Uh, that's coming up in about four minutes time. Uh, if you're joining that session, you'll be uh, moved into the uh, waiting room, uh, and then rejoin the main session uh, when it starts at the top of the hour. So, uh, with that, uh, yeah, take take a break, get that, uh, get that cup of coffee or the quick bite of lunch, and uh, stretch the legs, and uh, hopefully you get um, some more of our sessions through today. So, thank you very much, and thank you, Derek. <laughs>